Let's do this. <laughs> From Microbe TV, this is Twevo, episode number 97, recorded on January 21st, no, 31st, <laughs> 2024. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Great to be with you. And um, Happy New Year, everyone. We are a little late to the game, I would say, but our first podcast live stream of 2024, and we're um, up and running. Wow, it is the first Twivo of the new year. That's absolutely right. Yeah, thanks for your patience. We were meant to pull this off last week, and I was running around. I was in Chicago, um, back at my old stomping grounds. No worries. And, yeah, but... Um, Good to be here. Someone, someone asked if you were in the incubator today, and they said they thought hmm. you might be. Did we talk about Ooh. that? Were you, did you take no. a trip or something? Well, I was in Chicago, but I didn't make it that far east. That oh, okay. been, yeah, that's still on. I can't believe I haven't gotten there yet in person. It's wild. Oh, uh, you will. You will. Pandemic included. But yeah, I will for sure. And um, a little bit too early to to uh, go on the record yet, but I think we have some fun plans that we're about to hatch for the 100th. <laughs> episode of Twevo yeah. in a couple of months here coming up this spring. Um, and so stay tuned on that front. I think we'll yeah. have some uh, uh, some in vivo situations coming together, which will be, I'm looking forward to this. It'll be really fun. Let me start by thanking our moderators today. This is the first of two live streams Whew. I'm, I'm going to be doing today. <laughs> Double and, header. Uh, the other one is not till uh, 8 p.m., so that's good. Anyway, folks who are here, uh, office hours tonight, 8 p.m., same channel. Don't touch that <laughs> dial. 8 p.m. And Eastern. And did I see you have Mark uh, Martin coming yeah, in? Yeah, Mark Martin's going to be my guest, yes. Fantastic. How's That'll his podcast fun. going? His podcast is going nicely. He has very good guests. Beautiful. should have you on, actually. He said he's looking for guests. I'll tell him. Yeah, Maybe come he's in. he's here. Yeah. Anyway, let me thank our moderators. Barb Mack is UK is here. Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Andrew is here from New Zealand. And Tom Steinberg is here from Eugene, Oregon. Fantastic. That, that'll do it. Thank you all for doing this. Yes, this is in vivo Twevo, live Twevo. <laughs> Nels loves the live stream format. I, actually, I do as well. Yeah. So uh, let, let's start by asking where you're from. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Andrew is in New Zealand. That's, That's very right. Cool. I, let me move yep. this thing. I just, you know, the worst thing you can do, Nails, is set up a new computer. Yep. Um, you, have to, you have to just do everything. I can't get Dropbox to work on it. It's just all my <laughs> files. I don't know why it won't work. But anyway, uh, Andrew, thank you for joining us yeah. from New Zealand. Tom, as I said, is in Oregon, and um, I know Noir is in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm Fantastic. not brilliant. The Nels is the brilliant part of this duo. Mm. He's a genius. He got the Genius Award. Nels, it's <laughs> certified. You're a genius, okay? <laughs> guilty, guilty as charged. I'm happy to uh, take on that that burden. Um, I think I, would, I think we should define create or you know uh, genius just as you know creativity having a little bit of impact, and so I'm happy to. Yeah. Try to you, explore you have, that uh, space together. I think in the whatever brilliance is coming across the live stream, it's it's all of us together doing that. It's really in the conversation that makes no, that I, possible. I, I think this is something unusual that most people don't do, right? And live stream two scientists ask, answer your questions, talk about science. I, I don't know why more people don't do it, but it's really effective. And as you see, you know, we have people who listen. MK yeah. is from Eastern. Massachusetts. Welcome back. 
Uh, Claire is from the UK. Great. Pete is from London. He hasn't checked into Tweevo for ages. What does that mean? Like a hundred thousand years? Is that <laughs> In evolutionary time? Yeah. <laughs> Evolution can move fast and we're glad you're back. Emmy Wheeler is from Helsinki. Welcome. Welcome. Jeremy's in Seattle. Seattle. Great. Alex is in Tucson, Arizona. Peter S. is from Boulder, Colorado. Hannah is from Utah. Great. Do you know Hannah? I know several Hannahs in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Utah is a small state, right? It's a small state. It's a good good community energy here. It, yeah. Salt Lake is the biggest city, correct? It is by far. And been, um, Any other big cities? Well, you know, the suburbs have certainly grown. Salt Lake's the biggest city by far. And it's sort of that classic, the, you know, from a political standpoint, that blue island in a red sea, which can be yeah. um, pretty frustrating uh, from time to time. We're in the middle of our, I won't go deep into the political weeds here. We're in the middle of our legislative session right now in Utah. And basically it's a yeah. lot of culture war kind of garbage coming across and um, <laughs> you just sort of weather the storm and go on with doing fun and interesting things with, with a great community of people. And that's one of the things I really like about Salt Lake, I have to say, is it's a city with, um, you know, all the energy, progressive energy and growing, but at the same time, small enough that you, you get to know people. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty fun, pretty energizing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hannah, you, you just, you know, inspired a lot of discussion there. <laughs> Elizabeth is from West Virginia. Great. Thanks Welcome. for coming. Yeah. Joseph is from Southern Ontario. <laughs> Jane is from Norman, Oklahoma. Fantastic. Welcome all. And and Andrew says, the ancient Romans thought we all had a genius. <laughs> yeah, and I like e that idea. Each yeah. of us had a little bit of genius in us. Is that what that means? I think so. There's a spark of creativity. That, I don't uh, see why not. I think everyone has genius in them of some kind they just have to discover it you know it's uh and a lot of people are shy about just doing what they want to do i think but but uh, Jer jeremy loves your definition of genius creativity having a little impact yeah i don't really like awards that single out <laughs> people because i think a lot of people are capable of not to denigrate your award or nobel prizes or no, any no. other i mean i've gotten awards too but of course Everybody should get an award, right? Well, yeah, that, that opens sort of a can of worms here. Kind of what we do. So the way I, <laughs> I understand, way, I understand. Yeah, yeah. The way I've tackled this with so I uh, no longer doing it, but I used to teach and designed and with a colleague here taught a critical thinking class for our first year grad students. Mm, cool. And one of the modules we did um, to kind of get at this issue of um, prizes and awards in science is we have this. Um, event it was a scavenger hunt where you get points blah, blah blah the teams do all this stuff and at the end of it we award this trophy mm -hmm. and make it into this big formal ceremony and when you look at the trophy it says something like sixth place in the adult bowling league and yeah you know something like that to try to illustrate sort of the you know what is it that we're really going after here what's this sort of subjective yeah. prize you know sixth you can make a trophy the size of a you know two meters tall, but it's for sixth place in a adult bowling recreational bowling league. And yeah. so, you know, how are we really measuring? And I think you're getting at that the day to day of, for example, in science, the teamwork that goes into advancing our knowledge or understanding and balance that with this sort of kind of, you know, pseudo celebrity and or the subjective notion of prizes and how they get awarded. And so it's, I'm not, um, <clears throat> I'm happy um, <laughs> to be um, sort of obviously um, in the company of the other MacArthur fellows, it's really a, an incredibly inspiring group. And so mm -hmm. um, I'm not downplaying sort of the, the, you know, energy of that recognition at all, but hopefully balancing that with, yeah, exactly what you're saying is, you know, sometimes these things get way out of balance and the value we put into it, whether it's a Nobel prize, a fellowship, whatever it is, um, can kind of, you know, also weigh I think on the scientific process as well as we advance our careers. I think everybody has the capability of contributing, of having a little impact, but a lot of people can't because they're born into a situation that they can't rise above. Right. And they can't get an education. They don't have money and they're stuck. And I 
think it's a shame because humanity, every human has something in them that could be a little, have a little impact. And so it's unfortunate that so many people can't. So, you know, I, that's why we do these podcasts to try and spread information as much as we can. And I know a lot of people get inspired and say, oh, I didn't know that. I want to do that. And I think mm-hmm. you know, that's a little bit that we can do. Agree. Cast a wide net and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, we have uh, Brian from New Jersey right across the Hudson River there. Great. All right. That'll we've got a good, we've, yeah, we've got a good crew on hands. Thanks everyone for showing up. And the good news is um, we've got some exciting science to share. Uh, we're really excited about this one. I think um, it's going to be good. So the paper. Hey, hold on. We got another moderator in the house. Steph, oh, good. SF. Welcome, Steph. Thank you for Yeah, coming thanks today. for being here. Oh, we're going to talk about predatory fungi now. This is so cool. I know. This is like um, <laughs> disclaimer. This is kind of why I'm in the game is for <laughs> science like this. So this the title of the paper that we're um, going to be kicking around today is key processes required for the different stages of fungal carnivory by a nematode trapping fungus. <laughs> I mean, they should turn on this. Uh, uh, where is the darn thing now? Where is the button that I push? It's hidden. Okay. Going Hang on. For the, I, wanna, the, I want to uh, push cover the button. Sheet of, yeah, the it, cover sheet of the paper. There we go. Uh, Beautiful. That's, that's not quite Right. Let me fix this. I'm, you know, as I said, I'm, I got a new computer here. There we go. Is that it? I think so. I'm, um, you're lagging kind of, behind. I'm, I'm flying blind here myself. Oh, wait. So you're not seeing. Yeah. Okay. So that's another setting. I have yep. to do that. Hang on. Uh, let's turn off the screen share. There's a setting, a preference that lets you see the live stream. So yep. let's see. Interview, guest view. Broadcast. There it is. There you go. There it is. Yep. There you go. Ba- that I one I remembered. Yeah. Beautiful. Whenever you set up a new app on a new computer, everything is set to the default, right? Now we can go back to the paper here. Yeah. There you go. Carnivory. Go. Carnivory or carnivory? I guess it's carnivory. <laughs> yeah. Either works. These are, this is wild, right? So this is fungi. Filamentous fungi that undergo a developmental switch to feed on nematode worms in the soil around them. I mean, the the sort of we'll, so we'll dig into the evolutionary process here. Some of the hmm. kind of genetic basis of some of this wild behavior that's going on in the soil right beneath our feet. But this is you know this is evolution off the charts in my thinking. The complexity of simple critters. Um, in this case of a fungus that can hunt nematode worms if sort of the environment is just right. And how does this, like, what is the sort of molecular basis? This kind of hits all the high notes for me uh, in terms of really interesting, just sort of observations of the natural world around us, how it relates to really interesting evolutionary courses. Um, and then how we can sort of put that into a framework, an experimental framework to really understand the basis of how this works. So let's give full credit here to the authors as we get going. So um, this is from Yenping Shu's lab. She's located at Academia Sinica. This is in Taipei, Taiwan, the Institute of Molecular Biology there. The first authors of this paper are Hung Chi Lin and Guillermo Vidal Diaz de Ulzurun and um, another group of people or a group of collaborators um, uh, that have contributed to, to this paper that I just, for me again, is, um, I mean, it's a little bit in the sort of style and taste of the work, but I just think it's off the charts interesting. Published just a um, couple months ago in PLOS Biology, open access, totally available. Um, if you hear us as we're talking through this, if you want to dive mm-hmm. into it, don't hesitate. I mean, I think you'll be rewarded with just interesting biology, the deeper you go into this. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, open access, yeah. Open access, yeah. So our, our another moderator has joined us, Les. Oh, Thank great. you, Les. Appreciate got a it. Great crew on hand here. And you know, just in time, I think, for this really cool predator prey relationship. So we've talked, you know, a little bit about predator prey. We've mostly focused on sort of uh, uh you know infectious microbes. So um, almost an offshoot potentially of predator prey, but at a different level level of biological organization as it relates to things like viruses, infecting hosts, or bacteria, other parasites. 
here now, you know, we're in the soil and we have uh, a, a microbe, a fungi that actually it's a filamentous one. So multicellular, it grows into these um, larger hyph so-called hyphal structures, hmm. um, but finds itself interacting with these microscopic or near microscopic nematodes or worms all of the time. And somehow over the course of evolution, this really wild behavior has, has um, you know, shown up. And so this is not too surprising when we think about, you know, the, sort of the selective pressure that um, predator prey relationships can sort of provoke. So again, this is all random mutation selection acting on it. If it's life or death for your population, you can see sort of these evolutionary innovations playing out in really interesting ways. And this is a great example of it. And so the um, the acronym here, the NTFs, nematode trapping fungi. Um, these are uh, different, and it's this has cropped up several times. This behavior has evolved multiple mm -hmm. times in different fungal lineages, and we'll just look at one of them today, where the authors take a deep dive into some of the genetic mechanisms here. So the predatory fungus here is called um, Arthrobotrys oligospora. Um, as I mentioned, multicellular. Um, Looks like, you know, if you're digging through the dirt and you see that those sort of mycelium, that sort of fungal looks like any of that, but it can actually transform or undergo this developmental switch to trap and feed on worms, to, to feed on nematode worms, which are highly abundant in the soil. And so it's really cool here. So let's maybe step back and hey, think about <laughs> the most nematodes, the most abundant animals on the planet. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Not just in soil on the planet. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And that highlights, you know, I think where, you know, evolution, given the chance for these sort of wild things to sort of crop up, yeah. it's happening generally when there's just the probability, right? So massive populations, short generation times, that describes nematodes will mm -hmm. be the prey in this relationship. The predators, fungi also all around us sort of hiding right, right beneath our feet um, in massive abundance. And so again, that sort of is the raw material somehow for natural selection to act. Yep. And so in this case, um, usually, so sort of the fungi kind of feeding that we're familiar with and comfortable with are um, <laughs> these types of things happening, just like feeding on, you know, what, um, they're, they're, what's the technical phrase? They're saprotrophic. Saprotrophic. They're, yeah. They're feeding on decaying plants, leaves, et cetera, in the soil, just yep. sort of detritus or organic matter in the soil. But so in this case, what the authors and others have um, been studying or highlighting for some time, uh, which still to me just like takes my breath away when I think about just how cool this biology is. So when these hmm. um, species of fungi are starved, um, they can, you know, they've sort of maybe exhausted the nutrients just in their sort of neighborhood. These fungi can't swim or, you know, move around too easily. They can divide and form these filaments. But when they've sort of exhausted that um, leaf litter, the sort of herbivore lifestyle, if they're in the, if they sense the presence of the most abundant organisms on earth, these nematode worms, there's a, this uh, developmental switch that gets flipped. And in that sort of two, both sensing the lack of one type of nutrition, but the potential to gain this other, they, be, they be transform into carnivores. And um, basically some of their cells completely change in form. Um, and, and they can, uh, you know, they're described as adhesive nets. This is almost like a spider web, um, as some mm -hmm. of the cells. And that's the species we're, we're discussing today. Others form these, um, rings, some of them constricting rings. Vincent, this looks like a lasso where the filamentous <laughs> fungi <laughs> forms a loop, the nematodes, and we'll talk about this in a moment, swim into this or migrate into this and yeah. it constricts and then the other cells of the fungi can start to penetrate start to digest now the nematode prey they can form these columns and knobs all of this wild morphology um hmm. and it's not just that developmental switch there's also all of this communication going on right and so the both the fungi begin to sense the presence of those nematodes so they're listening in on some of the small molecules that the nematodes are secreting to communicate with other nematodes um, as part of that lifestyle or life history. And then <laughs> the fungi also secrete cues. So mimics of sex pheromones that attract the hermaphrodite and female worms to the, the traps, um, you know, and, 
and then start to um, catch and digest um, these. They're secreting both sex pheromones and food. So the worms are, you know, fooled into thinking there's both meal, a meal and a mate to be had by mm. migrating towards and interacting with the fungal predators here. Nature is evil, Nels. It's a mess. And, and so this ability to gain resources, right, as it plays out, whether it's a lion on the Serengeti plain or a, a, a mycelium in the soil beneath our feet, we're just starting to glimpse at all the possibilities. And of course, there's like many more out there to discover going forward. So, Dad, okay. now it's very important that you mentioned this, but these hmm. fungi are sessile. They don't move. So. Exactly. And so in this, yes. And so I think that starts and I think we'll circle back at the end to kind of talk about, put this into a bigger sort of ecological picture potentially and sort of daydream about how this could evolve in the first place, these sort of complicated behaviors and switches, even in these very relatively or seemingly simple, um, you know, um, fungal species. Yeah. Um, but that's part of it, right? So the, if you can't move, you'll probably, you know, you have the potential to exhaust the nutrient sources around you. And then how do you, something that can move, how do you bring those nutrients to you? Um, I think is really fascinating. And then to see this complex biology sort of perk up that involves communication both between worms and, and fungi is really, really something else. And so that kind of, hopefully that sets the table. I've been, um, you know, I don't think I can be dramatic enough in the description. I mean, it's and words and podcasting, live streaming sort of fails to actually see some of this under the microscope um, to see this, you know, in real life. But so that brings us to then the question of, okay, well, how does this paper sort of advance in understanding the evolution mm. of this complex behavior, these NTFs, uh, nematode trapping fungi, not to be mistaken, by the way, with uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, but that's a whole nother. Um, yeah, so. watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. I had to sneak that joke in somehow. Um, okay. So maybe you authors... could explain that to me someday because I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that if, maybe later on. There's plenty <laughs> of cool biology to, to focus on in, instead of cheap jokes here. But um, okay. So what do the authors do? So first they conduct a time course. Um, and I don't know, if Vincent, if you can pull up figure one here, just to give us a peek under the hood mm -hmm. of, of the sort of, you know, some snapshots of this process. And so, you know, yep. the, the here stages here that I've been um, kind of, oh, here we go. Yeah. So kind of trying to represent up at the top there. So we can see some worms wiggling around in these snapshots. Uh, and so you have pre-exposure um, and then they set up this window of um, sort of five time points. Uh, what they what they describe as hours post exposure HPE, meaning that the fungi, um, the nematode trapping fungi, is exposed to nematodes. So they've been starved already in the pre exposure stage. So that's sort of half of the switch. And then when they sense the presence of these nematodes, that's what sort of launches this really fascinating behavior, predator prey behavior. And so you've got um, attraction. Um, where uh, they're attracting the, the prey, sensing, trap development, and then digestion. And so, you know, they've defined these phases. And then what they're doing over that time course is trying to profile the transcription, the production of messenger RNA. And so this is, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the genetic basis of some of the, it doesn't, probably doesn't describe the entire process. So there's other, you know, pro, at the level of proteins that already have been translated. You can imagine that that's part of the, of the sort of biological conversation in a sense. Um, but this gives you like a really strong footing to think about the different genes involved in this process. And so in that sort of top panel, you can, you can see um, the presence of worms, more worms showing up. Um, there's uh, some trapping happening and then the digestion. So by the beginning, there's very few fungi. By the end, there's more fungi and there's no worms left. That's because they've been <laughs> digested. They've been preyed, they've been successfully preyed upon by these predatory fungi. Hmm. And so to begin with, so this kind of gives you the first sort of, you know, you start to at each step, what you're looking for are genes that are or genes that are upregulated, their transcription. So the amount of message that can, can get translated into protein are either upregulated or downregulated. And it's that change then that's sort of shared among the replicates that starts to just give you maybe the framework of what's the genetic program that underlies this developmental switch from going from just feeding on the kind of leaf matter around you to forming these trap cells 
that do all of this fascinating predatory biology and then eventually digesting them. And so to begin with, you know, it just sort of starts to establish that framework so they can, um, have, as they've defined those phases and then put the upregulation or downregulation, they've, you know, do the comparisons between different stages. Also, how, um, you know, reproducible is that? What replicates? Um, it's interesting. I don't, they don't mention this. They don't need that. They haven't really synchronized the cells in any way. You could imagine that mm. depending on, you know, um, sort of the cell cycle, but of course there's sort of the complexity of the filaments and which cells are dividing as the, as the sort of hyphae, um, is developing the mycelium, uh, is developing how that, that might be some noise in the data, but they still are able to document, um, in the end, about 160 genes that are upregulated through different sort of um, parts of the time course, hours post exposure to prey nematodes, mm -hmm. um, and th about 320 that are downregulated. And so they kind of describe this as a core set of um, genes or gene regulation that's involved in the predatory behavior. Um, and the broad conclusion here is that, you know, it really is a dynamic process. So the sort of fungi is going about sort of life as usual, um, feeding on the soil around it, and then really sort of spring into action as they are starved and sense these um, prey around, and then execute this program of um, go making, attracting, making contact, and even digesting these things. So they have to penetrate the worms, the fungi, um, infiltrates and then sets off, kicks off a whole nother interesting sort of, um, potential conflict between predator and prey, um, mm -hmm. where worms, for example, have antimicrobial proteins that are probably fighting back in a sense. The prey isn't just sort of, um, you know, totally, um, vulnerable here. So, um, that allows them to, to just get the framework to start to narrow. So like, um, thinking about some of the key processes and functions. So next they focus on the trap generation, right? So the cell actually changes its morphology. It goes from just sort of part of this, um, longer filamentous structure into, in this case, an adhesive net. So what classes of genes are involved in this? And so one of the major players is just ribosome biogenesis, meaning, and this, you know, meaning that you're, sort of those cells are specifically programmed to translate a lot of new protein. And this is a little bit sort of, you know, at, f at first blush, I would say it's a little bit contradictory because remember the cells are starving and yet they're, they're um, basically making this daring proposition, which is let's gear up to make a lot more protein, even in the absence of nutrition. Um, and so, you know, it really, how you evolve that sort of complex behavior in a sense, um, right at the edge of existence. Cause mm. you, if you're starving, right. And you invest in a lot new, of new protein production, you could risk just dying out before you successfully yeah. trap a worm at all. Biological so, risk. Nothing happens without it. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's what, uh, what do we say? Like evolution, you step down a dark alley and you get in trouble. Like yep. this is a nice, I think example, <laughs> <laughs> nice example of that. Um, and then, um, you know, from there, uh, so you're, if these cells that are sort of poised, they're undergoing this morphology change and they're gearing up to produce all these proteins. Um, they put forward based again on the kind of transcriptional analysis that a lot of these proteins are going to be secreted and that mm. speaks to the interaction, right? So you attract, then you make contact. And again, that's where a lot of the biological action is happening here. And so, um, you know, not only are you upregulating these proteins and, and I should say, by the way, the good news here is that the fungi, the species of fungi is genetically tractable, meaning that you can mess with its genome. You can, um, as an experimentalist, you can go in and say, make a hypothesis, which is, okay, um, you know, we see all this upregulation across the whole, um, you know, all of the cells that form the filament, which ones might be doing this behavior. And so they actually take a red fluorescent protein, fuse it to a histone gene, which are in the nuclei um, of the genes that are upregulating all of this, potentially upregulating all of this, um, you know, ability to translate proteins. And then they can look in the filament and it's lights up. This is in figure two, it just lights up red. Um, all of these cells that are very specific to the, the ones that become trap cells. And so that starts to, you know, I think capture how the, the specificity of this is happening. And this is, so it's a multicellular fungi, but you know, at, at, in regular feeding, all of those cells basically look the same. And so it's in the specialization, which is again, one of these sort of major conceptual leaps 
for evolutionary mm -hmm. complexity is to go from single cell or just identical multi-cell into specialized cell. And then here we're sitting podcasting today, live streaming as a result of all of our specialized cells, right? And so again, a sort of a glimpse, it's not that the fungi haven't had just as much time to evolve as we have, but even these things that we think as simple organisms, simple critters are doing all this complex behavior and it sort of hints or gives you know, some ideas, opens your thinking about how this kind of complexity could have evolved in our ancestors, tracing back, you know, billions of years in some of those cases. Okay, so back to this idea. Now we've kind of started to narrow in on the specialization of these trap cells, and they're um, now proposing which of the proteins that the fungi encodes or makes are actually secreted. And so they use, um, you know, uh, I think some really good sort of out of the box kind of filters to add, to say, okay, are there signal peptides? That means that the protein when it's made will be put, it will be within the membrane trafficking protein will be positioned so that it can be released from the cells, can interact with the environment around it. In this case, it's sort of like, you can imagine the timing of um, first making that trap and then um, transitioning into the digestive process when a worm, when a nematode shows up. And so, in addition to sort of predicting a thousand of these proteins, they can then apply filters in which, and so the next filter they add, in addition to those sort of key features of a secreted protein is, is it upregulated at this part of the time course? That narrows it about in half to 500 proteins, which is a lot. Um, but again, some complex biology here. And so to kind of, you know, again, as the experimentalist to put together these observations with, with testing a hypothesis, they decide to try to disable the secretory pathway. So they find a snare protein in the fungal genome, which based on a lot of work in some of the more traditionally studied fungi, baker's yeast and other systems, cell biologists have defined all of this um, protein machinery that allows these cells, including our own, to secrete proteins. Um, we're doing this after a meal, right? So our digestive enzymes or our pancreas as we're sort of balancing glucose levels, we have, it's all of the same cell biology just playing out sort of in a different, in a different way. They take what, what's called a snare protein, they disable it, they make a mutant, and then they ask what happens when you put these mutant worm, or sorry, with these mutant fungi up against potential prey worms, what happens to protein secretion? And it goes way down. And so, and this impacts the predatory behavior. And so basically the C. elegans, which is again, a model system, uh, the worm here, the prey, at least with this fungi, when they put them together, 0% escape. So if the fungi has set the trap, this species of worm is 100% vulnerable to the trap. However, in that snare mutant that they make, a very specific kind of genetic scalpel to this one protein in the entire genome, now 70% of the potential prey escapes. And so they really hit on a good pressure point there. The, you know, and I think that tells us obviously, or not, maybe not so obviously, but what tells us is that secretion is necessary. You need to secrete these proteins in order for the predator to be successful. Um, in this case, at least, you know, um, in this case, hundred percent of the time with 70% escaping, if you just manipulate this one protein. And, and the key here is that the traps don't seem to be defective in any way. Exactly. So right. the traps look the same. You sort of step through that developmental switch. Everything looks fine. And then in that moment where you sort of secrete some set of proteins, potentially mm -hmm. hundreds of them, everything goes off the rails 70% um, of the time. Um, if, yeah. I found it interesting that this organism, A. oligospora, is genetically manipulable. It must be a model organism, right? They've been working on it for years. Exactly. And so huge credit here to Yen Ping Shu as uh, she transitioned from a postdoc and built this research program. Um, I think she was out on, in California doing her postdoc and then brought this um, to Taiwan mm -hmm. as she opened her own lab to Taipei at the Institute for Molecular Biology at Academia, Academia Sinica. And huge credit for the work that goes into taking this, you know, sort of quote unquote domesticating this wild species of fungi in order to make these genetic manipulations, because that really underlines sort mm -hmm. of, you know, the ability to take that experimental view and to really understand how this evolution happened um, or could have happened by sort of pulling it together on that level. So we've got the, um, you know, so we've, we've, we've by the way, that's, that's, a great example of how you take RNA seek data and not just yeah. show it, but you make 
you test it to say, yeah, this gene going up is functionally important. It's making the traps work better. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm glad you're kind of pausing us to say that, Vincent, because, you know, so much of the work today kind of stops at that sort of, it's, yeah, it's yeah. relatively easy to do the RNA kind of cataloging, sequencing, and even do that in sophisticated ways. And that's worth a lot. Don't get me wrong. But I think what really distinguishes this work is in the ability to sort of manipulate, pull it yeah. apart, make it kind of squeeze deeper biological meaning out of the process that's unfolding. And then you can go back and look at the evolutionary view as you understand that and really learn how some of this complexity can evolve. And I think this will unlock a lot of really surprising interests. It's the same thing that we talk about on Twivo all the time is that it's somehow in the study of these worms in the study of this fungi that we learn more about ourselves but that we couldn't have predicted. It's just our curiosity drives us to understand this, our creativity to sort of mm -hmm. pull it apart. And then it will pay these dividends that we can't imagine a decade, two decades into the future as we're sort of, you know, worrying about our own species or understanding the world around us. It's really the magic of fundamental science, of basic science playing you're basically out. Basically, you're saying we need to be patient when new techniques are developed. It may take some time before we really knew, know how to use them. Right. Exactly. And the danger here is that if the field is just racing ahead, cataloging everything, um, you know, someone like Yanping Shu in her lab is, mm. is sort of patiently building these tools that that science takes time. And if we're competing for limited resources, sort of the predator prey relationship of science funding is that this gets sort of snuffed out because, yeah. you know, it doesn't sort of have the same tempo that some of the more cataloging approaches do. And so this is why, you know, I think both you and I, Vincent, are drawn to studies like this because it sort of has that deeper sort of, um, you know, thread kind of going through it. Okay, so let's return to some of these details, these deeper threads and see where we end up. And so in addition to now kind of narrowing in on the importance of all these secreted proteins, they, they, act, they highlight one family of them um, and, and again, using evolution sort of to try to prioritize these. So it's a family of 30 genes that are upregulated right at this time point, which is now the trap cells are there. They're adhere they've trapped the worm prey and, um, you know, and they're in it's a, this burst of secretion is happening. And so there's 30 upregulated genes. They contain a domain. It's called, not the, it's alphabet soup here. It's DUF3129. Um, do you remember what DUF uh, stands for? <laughs> no, don't. The, it don't. Uh, domain of unknown function. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most. I think we sad. should invent one now. It's called <laughs> duh, the duh yes. domain, the domain of unknown homology. How's that? I love it. Yeah. Count me in. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't learn too much just from <laughs> just looking at the sequence identity here. Um, but what you do learn by taking that evolutionary view is that these species of fungi, the ones that trap and, and eat nematodes, these carnivores, um, they uh, evolution, they've um, undergone repeated expansions of mm -hmm. the set of genes that are secreted. And that's, you know, so the comparison here is to things like baker's yeast that have like, or, or even humans, actually, I think we have proteins in this family, secreted proteins, like between zero and five, depending on the primate you look at, depending on, you know, the yeast that you look at. But um, consistently in the multiple times this has evolved in different uh, NTFs, nematode trapping fungi, there's more like 20 or 30 of these things. So they're secreted, they're upregulated at the right time. In evolution, they've been tinkering with this. There have been expansions. And so what that all kind of hints at is that there's some function here that's probably important. And so based on this, this kind of hallmark of evolutionary innovation based on the repeated expansions of this gene family, they name these trap-enriched proteins or TEPs. So still alphabet soup, but it's getting closer to actually a useful, meaningful function versus the duff domain of unknown function. This moves forward. into your domain here, expanded genes, right, now. Yeah, we love this. And so we see it <laughs> <laughs> we see it as a potential evolutionary innovation in virus genomes and bacterial genomes in our own genomes when we think about immune functions. This is sort of the some of the bread and butter of uh, evolution sort of reading or the readouts of evolution for yeah. interesting biology. Exactly right. And so they now kind of narrow in. So how do you study 30 of these things? You know, they've ended up prioritizing. So they took the four highest expressed ones, meaning the most message at that sort of moment where you make that protein that you can then secrete as that um, predatory behavior is unfolding. And then they ask, 
they fuse this to a green fluorescent protein and they ask using those great genetic tools, what's going mm -hmm. on here? <laughs> and figure four, you can see it lighting up like a Christmas tree in these traps, in the trap cells, the exact cells where you would, um, where you'd mm -hmm. predict. And then even better, you can mutate. So they take TEP1, one of those four highest expressed genes, delete it, look at how those mutants do when they are exposed to nematodes, exposed to prey, and only 10% of them can catch prey. And so um, again, from 100% down to 10%, just by now deleting this one protein among the hundreds of ones that are secreted in this, you know, the ability to like, so usually there's some redundancy there as you see these gene expansions, the fact that they were able to see such a dramatic reduction is really impressive. You know, they've really put their finger on some of the important um, biology here as it relates to the mechanism of the, of the ability of these fungi to prey on worms. What do you think so, is uh, going on? You think these are sticky proteins? <laughs> Yeah. So right that, then that's the next question. You keep drilling deeper and deeper into the biology and here they hypothesize, just like you're saying, there must be, there could be a role in adhesiveness, right? So if you mm -hmm. secrete this at the right time, so you're, they already know you're and based on a lot of other work, they're sending out these cues to attract the worms. And then the notion is some of these proteins might be sort of the stickiness of that process. And so, um, alternate hypothesis, it could be, um, enzymatically acting to alter the cell wall. Um, you know, and, or it could be in and of itself, it mm. have an adhesive property, all yeah. very testable hypotheses. Yeah. I would, forward. I would make these proteins and add them to worms and see what happens. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or add them to a, you know, a, a filamentous fungi species that doesn't do this behavior. And then, yeah. you know, and then, you know, they might not, they're, they aren't going to go from zero to predator, but do, then if you give them worms to them, do they actually stick? Yeah, uh, right. And that would start to get at it as well. And so all kinds of potential ways forward um, for the system to really understand this at the molecular level and the sort of mechanism, which is, which is really fun. So that kind of brings us up, you know, sort of this like great menu of um, stepping through these developmental stages after exposure to the worms. And that brings us to the next like critical phase, which is you don't just trap them, but you eat them. You have to digest them somehow. And so how does this happen? Fungi don't have a mouth. They're not generally, you know, like professional um, um, phagocytic cells, mean, mm -hmm. you know, meaning so if we look at amoeba, the white blood cells going through our own bloodstream that can, you know, form these compartments around either, um, you know, an infectious microbe or a nutritious particle, they don't have that sort of gear. And so, um, so this sort of highlights, you know, again, sort of the evolutionary path that these fungi have taken to become quote unquote carnivores is now thinking about the digestion. And so both the penetration and the digestion for me, this kind of caused me to pause as I was reading it and thinking about the worms. So it's wild here hundred percent of these worms are vulnerable to this behavior. And so there's got to be cases of counter evolution. So C. elegans, this mm. is the, the model nematode worm genetic model. We know we have a ton of genetic tools. Uh, you know, we have all of this great, um, genome information annotations. Some of the first genomics was done in C. elegans, uh, annotating the genome. And yet here it's completely vulnerable, but are, what about the diversity among C. elegans. Are there strains or species of worms that can escape? That could, that could teach you sort of about what, what's going on with the prey here. What are the sort of possibilities for countermeasures? And so a whole nother- yeah, they're, they're probably using yeah. a standard lab strain, right? Exactly. And by the way, you know, so I love this just even from a sort of a therapeutic standpoint as a scientist, when you can take your model organism. So, you know, Yenping Shu, when she was a postdoc, was working on C. elegans. And so take your model organism and you know, all of your experiments are failing. You can't get your <laughs> mutants. You're just frustrated with your system. Just feed it to a predator. And it's just therapeutic to watch this thing get consumed. It's, <laughs> like, it's like, okay, yeah. you're not going to unlock, you know, you know, reveal your biological yeah. secrets. I'll just feed you to a predator. Yeah. How do you like that? So I used to do that. I was, uh, <laughs> I was studying as a PhD uh, student, um, a, a prey or organism, a ciliate that I used to feed to predators, um, to kind of just like, you know, whatever, make it yeah. through my, uh, my PhD and all of the ups and downs. Anyway, I'm digressing. So let's stay here. So the, the key evolutionary or sort of functional events in predation here is the fungus has to penetrate 
the prey, the worm, and begin to digest it. And so at this phase, as they go through all of their RNA-seq data, so the upregulation of the messenger transcripts that will become the proteins that are sort of at the right time and place acting to promote the predation, they see a massive upregulation of proteases, more than 300 of them that are sort of candidates um, in the process of digesting the prey. And so the notion here is that the fungi sort of penetrate, the filament grows into the worm, they secrete again all these proteases, it starts to digest the prey in situ, and then the released nutrients are somehow absorbed or taken mm -hmm. up um, by other processes, cell biological processes of endocytosis or internalization so that basically the predators can harvest the nutrition around them. So from a geneticist standpoint, this is a little bit hard to study because there's now 300 of probably you'd predict that a lot of these functions might be redundant. Basically, if you take mm -hmm. away one of them, you still have a couple hundred that might sort of back up the first one. And so to tackle this, just to begin with, they use a drug um, that inhibits sort of protease activity just in general. And so geneticists are always a little bit skeptical of the sort of using drugs that are can have all these off target effects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, in this case, it starts to, um, they, they are able to um, limit the colonization. So part of that digestive process as they um, do these drugs. Um, but they also, you know, I think in the end um, are able to at least see a hint of the down regulation of some of these proteases, which is consistent with, with sort of what you would expect here, um, given the, the biology. This is probably where the paper kind of, you know, any one paper can only kind of advance your understanding so far. And so this is kind of brings us to the water's edge, I would say, mm -hmm. of this system and understanding the genetic basis of this wild behavior. Let me show you uh, one of these images here. These are pretty cool. Love it, yeah. So this is the protease. Um, experiment yeah, figure, figure five right yep yeah. yes so the protease is in is in green correct exactly and so they're using that trick again they're fusing the proteins to gfp uh in order to localize uh some of this some of this biology and so the key here is the control in panel this is panel c um mm -hmm. uh versus their intervention um uh, which is the protease inhibitor cocktail. That's the PIC. And so um, what they see in the control is by hour 18, I mean, it's pretty subtle here, I would say, but this is the um, digestion of the worm um, uh, or the colonization, I should say, sorry, of the, of the fungi taking over sort of the worm's body. Um, and in the PIC, the protease inhibitor cocktail, it's more on the surface uh, there's uh, less colonization. It's probably most dramatic actually at that 12 hour time point, yeah. right? So yep. you can see yep. a lot of green kind of uh, outside and so inside associated with the worm. Whereas at 12 hours, when they inhibit the proteases, um, it, it appears to delay the ability of the fungi to really sort of infiltrate and take over the prey, the nematode worm. By 18 hours, it's actually catching up. So it's Again, it's sort of not this like fine scalpel, genetic scalpel that they use in some of their other experiments, um, but sort of gets at the um, yes. the process here, begins to sort of point to the direction that might make sense. I think I misspoke. This green is, is probably the fungi, right? Correct. Yeah, the that's the fungi. Because the protease wouldn't be affected by nope. the protease inhibitor in this sense. So the green is the fungi infiltrating, wrapping itself around the, the worm. When you use a protease inhibitor, you delay it at 12 hours, yeah. Exactly right. And then to the left there, um, these are so the, that kind of heat map from blue yeah. to red. Yeah. So that's during this process. These are genes that are being either turned up or turned down or are staying the same. Yeah. And so that's what they're kind of highlighting are the genes that are illustrated in red, meaning there's a lot more of that message, the, a, lot, a lot more of the ability to make that protein, whether it's a protease or other, you know, um, factor involved here. And they're pointing out um, a certain class of proteases, metalloproteases, they think yeah. based on the upregulation in future work, those might be the ones to focus on yeah. as being sort of the key, um, you know, sort of key effectors, so to speak, in the in this part of the of the predation cycle. Very cool. Yeah. Again, can't get enough of this. So, uh, <laughs> big fan here. So. Um, so that brings us kind of to the you know discussion here and so they point out that um you know the 
the, the hint at, and I think there's more work coming from this group and others about what's going on with the prey here. Is there the ability to fight back? And in fact, the nematodes have a set of um, uh, proteins, antifungal proteins, antimicrobial mm -hmm. proteins, AMPs. And so what's cool about is the fungi probably have countermeasures, ways of inhibiting that because, you know, not only do they sort of capture hundred percent of these, but they digest them um, right. successfully. They gain that nutrition. And so who among those, the question then is among those sort of secreted proteins, which one are actually counteracting those antifungal proteins? That's pretty fascinating because if you put together those interactions, that sort of feeds into a topic that we've talked about a lot on the podcast, which is the red queen, um, which has come up even in, I think in our, in, in some of our mm -hmm. recent episodes. And so this is the idea of it takes all the running. This is Lewis Carroll's character, the red queen through the looking glass, glass, Alice from Alice in Wonderland fame takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. And so the notion is there's this rapid evolution in this case of the antimicrobial proteins or the antifungal proteins that are up against the inhibitors that the worm needs, <clears throat> or sorry, that the fungi needs to digest the worms. And so there's whole other layers of the biological interaction at the protein protein interface level. It'll be, I think, fascinating to dissect here. So why should um, the person on the street care about this now? <laughs> well, a couple of reasons. First of all, it's just beautiful, right? The fact that there's this complicated biology <laughs> happening right under our noses. Um, and also, you know, I don't think we should downplay sort of the impact of this on our ecosystems as, you know, as we face all kinds of uh, new challenges that our species is imposing on the world in terms of climate change, the ecosystems around us. Um, you know, what's going on under our nose and in terms of that complexity and how does this sort of influence entire ecosystems? We talk about this a lot, Vincent, when as it relates to one of our favorite topics, viruses, and the notion that like in, in um, aquatic environments, the ocean in particular, bacteria cells getting digested by viruses is turning mm -hmm. over entire sort of, um, uh, you know, nitrogen cycles, carbon cycles, the availability of nutrients. Yep. This is, I think this is a corollary of that happening in the soil, how impactful this is. Like, so how common this is, you know, in, in the impact on an ecosystem level, I don't know the answer to that. I think we're just, you know, glimpsing mm -hmm. at some of the fascinating predator prey biology here. Yeah, um, basically yeah. at this level, nature, everything's food for something else. That's what it's all about, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and you can boil down, there's a lot of ideas in evolutionary theory that it really boils down to how, uh, based on the nutrition or the en energy around you, yeah. how do you sort of, you know, to your, to, to any population, how does it deal with gaining or retaining those resources uh, in, in order to reproduce, to go into the next cycle? And so that also, you know, that's a part of this biology that's not addressed in this paper, but I think is also a, a really important. Why should we care about this is, you know, when you back, when you sort of put it in the evolutionary th framework and think about, well, how can something this complex happen in the first place? Right. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, we were kind of hinting at this a little bit, which is that sort of the riskiness of it where you're starving and then you actually put all this energy your limited energy into this sort of, you know, predatory behavior. And does that, how does that then ultimately read out in fitness? how much you reproduce. And so because these fungi can't move, they're sort of trapped in the soil or they're growing as, mm. as filaments, their real potential to broadcast or to, you know, expand their range, all these things is when they broadcast their spores. And so fungi do this, you know, in some cases by the billion as they reproduce, right? So they undergo a different developmental switch to go through meiosis, form all these spores. And then th these are the kids basically, right? Of the, yeah. of the parental filamentous fungi. And so I would love to see how this predatory behavior sort of feeds into that reproductive cycle, which then, right. you know, cause then now we've got the raw material, all of the genetics underlying this, how do you select on that? Aren't, you know, your the risk is that the, the ones that are just kind of doing the, what we might say is a more simple eating the, um, you know, leaf matter, et cetera, the saprophoric, um, lifestyle. How are these ones out competing or existing um, or uh, uh, with those ones? And so there must be these advantages there that might feed into the reproductive cycle so that they're broadcasting far and wide, they're reproducing or out competing some of their neighbors or at least competing with them. And so, yeah, I think that sort of really hints at, again, sort of, you know, how all this biology works. 
why should we care about it? I think you know how these kind of simple multicellular assemblages evolve this complexity holds some clues to thinking about how our own biology or complex biology has evolved. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, how do nervous systems develop? I think there's probably some clues in predator prey relationships that, sure. that both ha were happening in our ancestors and then play out today. Um, our immune cells, how do they specialize to sort of, you know, basically look like predators consuming infectious microbes? A lot of that biology is again, sort of right before our eyes. But to study that, we need experimental systems. And so I think that's why we should care about this and, and give credit to these authors is that they've actually figured out ways not only to generate hypotheses, but to test them. And so I think the sky's the limit basically in sort of um, really understanding this biology at a level where it might be applied to our own understanding, even of our own species. Yeah. And also now, so it's, that's a good point that it's about fundamental evolutionary principles, not necessarily predation and attracting prey, but by how systems develop. Exactly. And so in this case, you know, are there clues about those expansions of gene families, yeah. um, of these secreted gene families? And yeah, that can kind of conceptually allow us to get a better handle on when expansions are adaptive or not so. Um, you know, how much biological redundancy is built in here. The more you learn about this, the more you have that kind of analogy or comparison um, that you can draw to other systems, which sort of, and you know, honestly, if, uh, <laughs> uh, to get me across the finish line is right at, like you had me at hello, basically. I think I, I just find this biology totally inspiring, right? The fact that um, there's this, this just beautiful predator prey relationship happening here. Um, that's just that thing that kind of sparks your yeah. curiosity, feeds your creativity that ultimately, you know, hopefully leads to some impact yeah. down the road somehow. And so that's where this one really sort of calls out to me as a, a, a an important and exciting piece of work. The other aspect that I find interesting is that for these systems where one one of the players is sessile, doesn't move. You have to have mm. interesting strategies. But then as, as you become mobile, I'm not, you know, I'm thinking of a lion tracking yeah. prey. I'm not sure what what goes into that other than stealth, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so here, I think, um, well, so is there stealth here? I think the answer is probably yes. So maybe, you know, another analogy are there carnivorous plants, right? So there's a pitcher plant or a Venus flytrap, right, that we're all familiar with. And there, there's also, you know, so, here, so here's some examples of some analogies that in comparisons that I think are fun to draw and can even, you know, as you get more serious about it, um, can start to advance our understanding. So the, the Venus flytrap, and I'll, I'm pretty rusty on that biology, but it's not a simple trap, right? So yeah. it's, it's like a two hit model where the fly or whatever it is steps on there and there's like these specialized hair cells and it's attracting the fly, right? So it's using some of those cues, food cues at the very least. Maybe, and I don't know if there's also like they, those <laughs> flies think they're gonna find a mate there in the Venus flytrap. But it's when you hit that sort of, the hair cells get hit twice that it goes through the trouble of closing up, spending that energy to potentially have a meal. And so here, the two step is you're starving and there's worms around. And so it's sort of a different readout, but for the same kind of logic of being a predator. And so yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think as, as you kind of peel back the layers, you'll start to see those kind of echoes of the same strategies that play out, whether it's a, a fungi in the soil or a lion in the Serengeti. And so, so I saw I saw know. a little video on Instagram this morning. It was a mm. spider that dug itself into the sand, and only its feet were sticking out. And then a beetle walked over it, and then boom, right? <laughs> yeah, comes comes out and captures it. So that's another, so that's camouflage, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So stealth and, but also I'd be curious in that spider system, what the sensing is there, right? Exactly. On the yeah. predator side, right? Because again, that's a lot of energy for, for potentially like a failed scenario if it's not the right prey yeah. that, you're, yeah. that you're making contact with. And you're making contact with all kinds of stuff in your environment. And so that ability to discern as read out in this system and the several hundred genes that are upregulated so, so good. It, it, yeah. Andrew says the Venus flytrap can count the number of trigger hairs that have been touched by the prey. Exactly. And so okay. this is another example, I think, of how we think about plants. As, you know, like That's a pretty, to be able to, a plant counting 
or the logic of that, right, yeah. is is another example of this like complexity that's a, a, again right under our noses. So MK yeah. wants to know what do nematodes eat under other conditions? Would the worms be eating the fungus? Is that <laughs> why the signal from the fungus seems to need food? Don't they eat bacteria now? Is pretty correct. Much? Great question. And so the fungi, that's this is the sort of deception um, or mimicry, is it's not just the regular sort of fungal signals. And actually, I think that filament is pretty hard to digest. They also have to, you're right though, they have to, the predator prey relationship could be flipped over at any moment. In this case, um, and I don't know the details, it's published in some other work that's cited in this PLOS biology paper, worth a peek under the hood, no question. I think the biology here is fascinating, but they're making these food cues that you're, just like you're saying, Vincent, more resemble the bacteria that these nematodes usually prey on um, as they're going through the soil and eating food. So it's, it's, a decept, it's a deceptive act here. It's like, oh, come over here. You'll find some bacteria, but that sets the trap. What you find is this sticky surface, this net that captures you. And then the next thing you know, you're being digested. And so, yeah, it's a different, it's not, it's the fun, the fungus here is not being interpreted as food. It's being the um, worms are being fooled into thinking there's bacterial based food based on some of the small molecules that are being secreted. Yeah. So Pete writes, if the fungus was sensing oh. shortage of nutrient, wouldn't it be an advantage to hop on the nematode to help disperse it rather than <laughs> the time? Yeah. So great question. I think here um, it's, so it's sort of like, how do you feed into the biology that you already do as you add this complexity to it? And so, I mean, I love it. It's almost as like, for me, this cowboy analogy, the ones that make those rings, the lassos, like would you were kind of ride the back of this thing. And, yeah, but, yeah. But, the, but I think what's in place already with the species that don't do this predatory behavior that just depend on the ability to sort of eat the nutrients around them and then spread is all of that ability to form spores and then broadcast that already mm. exists. And so that probably means, this is all speculating, but that probably means from a kind of natural selection standpoint, that the contingency is that it, you've already solved that broadcast thing. And so it's the advantage here is the nutrition that might make your ability to broadcast better through the sort of mechanism that you've already evolved in place. And so that would be my best way of kind of, you know, rationalizing that. But again, it's through the comparisons and the experiments, even modeling or developing these systems to try to, to toy with that or tinker with that and see what you can kind of discover along the way. Great question. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, let's see. What's another one here? Um, Nels could make a fortune in agritech. Nematodes cause billions of damage and they have yeah. evolved to evade most chemicals. Yes. So uh, I'm not going to make a fortune here, but I hope that this group and others studying this do because that's exactly right. That's another great, you know, Vincent, getting back to your question, sort of even, you know, moving to practical outcomes. Um, so we're not working on these fungi, but what we are working on are the viruses of zebrafish and in part because there are these you know as we think about agritech as we think about fish farms um what is our ability to understand the infectious microbes that interact with these things that can really you know lead to billions of dollars of damage so it's across the board here as humans i think we we do well to understand yeah. these systems not only for that kind of intellectual or academic kind of conceptual view, but also much more practically. How do we deal as we, you know, advance our own ability to grow and to, uh, or to grow food, to grow crops, to grow resources, and to deal with the inevitable crashes from things like monoculture, yeah. Yeah. Um, vulnerability to nematodes for crops, um, whether it's all these environments, all the way out to fish farming, this is, this is a huge impact. And, and we do well to, to invest the time and energy to, to really have, to be able to squeeze meaning out of these model systems. Uh, Rona wants to know, what about people who eat lots of worms? <laughs> <laughs> Great source of protein. And, and we don't even need trap cells. We can just use our, um, you know, ability to, so I don't, I, <laughs> I think, um, you know, we're generally aiming more towards a little higher up the food chain, um, uh, so to speak, as we're eating things that eat worms, yeah, like yeah. fish, et cetera. But yeah, no, it's like, um, all of the above, as we think about people are increasingly thinking about insects as sources of proteins, worms could be right there too. Of course, we're also, um, we have plenty of pathogenic worms that we contend with, um, which continue to be in some cases, public health crises. And so, mm -hmm. um, I don't, excuse me, I don't expect that we're going to sort of deploy 
um, fungi to intervene in those cases. We have, we're making sort of more direct attacks, obviously, but um, yeah, this is all swirling around us for sure. <laughs> what about people? It's funny. <laughs> Love the question, Tona. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Looks like that's it for the questions now. Do you want to do some picks? This is great. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as always, enjoying the conversation here. So um, I'll start with my science pick of the week here. It kind of builds off of what we've just been discussing, Vincent. So this is um, another um, paper. It's not a source as much of a scientific primary literature paper, but at PLOS Biology, open source again, but it's openly available illustrations as tools to describe eukaryotic microbial diversity. And so now we're talking about fungi. This is now um, more protists, so ciliates and other aquatic critters and soil critters. Again, these single cells that have evolved all of this like super spectacular, complicated behaviors, um, morphologies, forms, functions, all of the above. And this great tool or resource. So this is Patrick Keeling, um, and um, and uh, who's up at um, University of British Columbia as well as um, Yana Eaglet. And so they have sort of a catalog here of really cool images that you can just kind of take and use to illustrate some of this cool biology. Mm. That's pretty neat. Yeah, visualizing some of this stuff because it's all you know microscopic or near microscopic to start to get organized about sharing this diversity of life I think is so important. So that's my science pick of the week. Some nice, Im uh, very nice uh, images here, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Vincent, how about you? What's your science pick of the week? Let me see. Let me turn this off. <laughs> so my pick is, uh, it's not it's not a positive thing, unfortunately, but I think we have to yep. deal with these things yeah, from yeah. time to time. Let me put this up. Yeah. It's a little nature article. Vincent, uh, sorry to jump in. You keep presenting this. I'll be right back. I've got I a, will. This is my, my second Twivo in a row with a quick interruption here. I'll be back in no one worries. minute. No worries. Go ahead. Yep. Take care of the problems. I'll, I'll be take, right back. Yep. Take take care of your lab problem. Hopefully there's uh, nothing bad there. Anyway, my pick is a Nature News article. Dana-Farber retractions. Meet the blogger who spotted problems in dozens of cancer papers. Uh, so this is about a number of uh, papers that um, had to be retracted. So the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, of course, is a well-known uh, cancer research and treatment place. And uh, six papers uh, had to be retracted and corrections had to be issued for 31 others. Um, after this gentleman, uh, Sholto... Um, David, he noticed that there were some irregularities. All right, he has a blog here where you can take a look at that um, irregularities in the paper. He found images uh, that seemed to be spliced, stretched, copied, and pasted, duplicated across figures. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, this, this raises the question, now that you can easily digitally manipulate uh, images, uh, some People, well, I don't know if they do it on purpose. I think people make mistakes quite often. Yep. Um, and they accidentally duplicate a figure because it's very easy to do that and, and not notice it. Um, and so he, this this gentleman uh, picks them up and flags them. And, of course, then they have to be fixed or completely retracted. So this is actually an, an interview with David mm. uh, about, you know, what he is doing here and, and so forth and why he does this. And he's got a PhD, um, and uh, he does this um, <laughs> by wow. looking at the, the literature and scanning images and you know, images like this. This one is he flagged some research containing images of mice that seem to have been uh, copied and pasted. You yep. know, so it's very easy to do that, as I said. Um, so that's my pick. It's not. <laughs> this is a difficult situation because you know when you have a a lab yeah. here. Let's do, do you have any recommendations? I don't want to make an environment where people feel harassed. The main thing I'd like to see is a polite response, acknowledge whether the error is there or not. But it's frustrating if you say, we'll look into this without acknowledging the errors or giving a timeline. Mm. I mean, I think if someone's looking around and, and finding potential errors, uh, that's good and you should yeah. respond to it. Um, and so I think in a digital era, this is going to be commonplace and it's not all fraud. 
I don't no. think that we should think it's all fraud. Um, yep. We, they're errors, right? I'm sure you've come across this now. I have, yeah. I've actually been drawn into a couple. So one of the things that, depending on the details um, for NIH-funded work, it can trigger an investigation, right? And so I've been involved, drawn in as a um, reviewer um, to try to discern whether some um, s suspicious looking data is, um, you know, mm. nefar it has a nefarious sort of fraud angle, or if it was like you're saying, um, some errors. And so, and I have to say, like my um, limited experience there is that something that can look pretty bad and you're thinking, oh, wow, this is like, they cooked the books here. Um, as we kind of carefully went through the primary data, how the um, sort of the data that was in question was used or interpreted was totally, it was a little bit sloppy um, as you're sort of, you know, doing all of this, but it wasn't actually, it turned out that the kind of figure in question, um, the original data, if they would have used it, actually was more supportive of the ideas that they were trying <laughs> to advance. And so it didn't, yeah, yeah. there was no advantage gained in that case. And that was sort of um, how it allowed us to sort of step through that. But yeah, no, so I think I think you're right. There's also, you know, in addition to this um, fellow, and I, I hadn't seen this article. I, of course, I read in the newspaper some of these retractions yeah. from Dana Farber. Um, but Elizabeth Bick is another person in the field. Mm -hmm. She has this like innate ability to like see a couple images and see that kind of repetition, that copy and paste. Yeah. Even in really complicated scenarios, it's almost like this, like it's her superpower somehow. And so she's... Um, you know, in some cases led the charge in um, having, whether it's a journal, um, an institute, like an internal like review board, like I was on in that case I was describing, um, you know, to take closer looks at this. And I think it's like, yeah, it's really important. So I think not to like, to sort of let the evidence come in or, you know, kind of innocent until proven guilty kind of approaches. But at the same time, we really do want to uh, make sure that if there is something underhanded going on, that that gets identified and it's sort of, you know, um, and identified and broadcast so that this isn't slowing down progress um, uh, where people yeah. are sort of chasing, right? <laughs> false ideas or false, you know, the data is not yeah, exactly. there as people try to replicate it, then science slows down because it's just not real. And so it'll eventually catch up at some point. And the real disappointing thing is if we're, you know, dealing with limited resources, limited time, we really want to advance science. And so this kind of throws sand in the gears of being able to do that as people are potentially making sort of short-term decisions about gaining an advantage. Oh, if we just have this data, it'll mean that it'll, you know, it'll get published in this cool place. My career will go forward, et cetera. We've really put this, a system under tremendous stress where people are making awful decisions in some cases. There's also just, you know, sloppiness comes in. And so dis discerning the difference between that ends up taking a lot of time and effort as well. And so, yeah. The the, um, the, the thing I don't want to happen is that this makes the press and then people think, oh, science is just so screwed up, right? Exactly. That's not the case. No, not at all. And and it's, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that we've talked about this and um, of course, even with the pandemic, right? So science, what's the scientific approach, which is different than sort of, um, I don't know, political approaches, et cetera, is like, you know, it's always, a we're always, we don't know the ground truth. We're working closer to that as we understand systems, but that kind of can collide in pretty awkward ways with mm. sort of communication strategies, et cetera. If we're, you know, the more as scientists that we're like, well, we think this is the case, but then six months later, we're like, oh yeah, actually based on this new information, we think this is the case. And so that can have this, you know, sort in sort of um, some circles, uh, especially ones increasingly political, that can have it can be a really tough way of communicating, or sort of yeah, um, just navigating with reality, which seems to be a bigger and bigger issue um, uh, uh, as we're seeing all over the place. Oh, it looks like our friend Matthias Fisher is here. Oh wow, yeah. Who you missed? You didn't go Matthias. to the giant virus meeting. You were out, you were somewhere else, but uh, I just uh, saw yeah. Matthias last December. Exactly. So, I'm so glad you picked this great paper. More scientists should put energy into presenting their complex topics in digestible and visually appearing pieces. That's your pick, I think, that he's talking about there. Oh, yeah. So both that and, um, um, uh, yeah, and talk about someone studying great. This is, Matthias is one of my science heroes for exactly this space that we've been <laughs> 
talking about on Twebo 97. Also, Matias, it was great to see you. Oh, and, oh, sorry to miss the giant virus meeting um, this time, but um, was thrilled to see your interview with Vincent, um, which was, uh, was I, I really enjoyed listening to that recording. Again, to be inspired um, by the great stuff that's happening in Matias' lab as well. Yeah, that was a good interview. We got to learn a lot about my virus and yeah. <laughs> all these uh, these Sputnik-like viruses. It was great. So exactly. thank you, Matthias. That was yep. cool. Very cool. Thanks for joining us, Matthias. And thanks, everybody else. I think that'll do it, Nels, right? Anything yeah. else you, you have there? Fantastic. No, sorry to step out. This is, I guess, the um, danger of live streaming. I've got about the attention span of one hour before I get interrupted with something these days. No it's, worries. It's totally okay. <laughs> All right. I want to, I, uh, that's a Twivo. You, the show notes will be at microbe.tv slash Twivo. There'll also be an audio um, version on microbe.tv slash Twivo. If you, if you enjoy our work, uh, we would love to have your financial support because that's how we do this. We don't do ads and, and so forth. And so please go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You don't have to give a lot. You could give a dollar a month. That would be great. It's less than a cup of coffee, right? And everybody drinks coffee or tea or some carbonated <laughs> beverage. Just take one of those and give it to us and we can keep doing this. That would be great. And, uh, you know, if you have picks or questions uh, you'd like answered, Please go to uh, microbe.tv. No, it's Twivo at microbe.tv. Email Twivo at microbe.tv. Of course, we do have a Discord server for those of you who are interested. The link will be uh, in the show notes if you want to join up there. Nels LD, my co host today, is at, uh, at cellvolution.org. On Twitter, he's L. Early Bird. Thanks, Nell. Nels. Great to be here, Vincent. Great to be together. And uh, looking for we're coming up close on triple digits here, so stay tuned. Some hopefully <laughs> some fun live streaming slash podcasting sl ahead. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me right here at microbe.tv. I want to thank the moderators today for joining us: Barb Mac, UK, Andrew, uh, Tom Steinberg, and Steph S F. If you uh, don't, and, and thanks all of you for coming. We really yeah. appreciate it and for hitting the like button. And by the way, if um, <clears throat> you, you don't have enough live streaming from Microbe TV tonight, we have another live stream, 8 p.m. Eastern time, office hours. Uh, my guest will be Mark Martin from Matters Microbial. Music you hear on Twivo, which... I should start at some point <laughs> is performed by trampled by turtles. You can find their work at trampled by turtles.com. You've been listening to this week in evolution, the podcast too loud. Wait, wait a minute. Too loud. Drink it. Podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then be curious. Bye-bye.